Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Michael Jordan from UC Berkeley. Uh, Mike got his PhD in cognitive science at UC San Diego down the road in 1985. Uh, from 88 to 98, he was at MIT. Since 98, he's been a professor in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department and also in the Statistics Department at Berkeley. And uh, we're pleased to have him here today. So let's welcome Mike. Uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed the previous talk, and if you want to link machine learning researchers, there's a must link between me and the previous speaker. Um, he was my TA back at Berkeley when I first arrived. <laughs> um, I want to thank the organizers uh, for organizing the conference the day of the NIPS deadline. Very nice of you. Um, so my head is still buzzing for writing NIPS papers, and I'll, but I'll do my best here. Uh, so this talk is about emergence of large data sets and this, this terminology of data science. Um, it is a real phenomenon. It, industry has really driven this. And uh, I think as academics, we really have to take this seriously and respond. So one response is to note that there's huge amounts of data, huge amounts, huge amounts of labels, and revive neural nets. Um, and I guess that's a good idea. That's ha been happening. Um, but that's not the only thing out there. And so my talk's about everything else. Uh, all the other stuff that's equally important, in fact, in my view, just as, um, you know, um, perhaps more important than, than, than neural nets. Um, so let me see if I, when I hit there. Okay. So I'm going to set this up by uh, imagining a, a, a discussion between one of my students who just graduated from Berkeley and is going into the, the Bay Area um, job uh, situation. So they arrive on day one, their boss says, I need you to build a big data system, whatever that means. And I, it, it's to replace our classic service with a personalized service. So this word personalization is really important in Silicon Valley these days. Every service that used to be offered uh, to an aggregate, uh, like search or commerce or medicine or whatever is now being offered in a personalized way. Uh, so why is that possible? Well, because there's data about roughly every person out there. And uh, so you can aim to offer such a service. All right, so you know, my student uh, says, oh, I think I can do that. The, the original service was just a machine learning system with a lot of parameters. The data came in, they adjusted the parameters. Now I'll just have 100,000 such models instead of just one of them, and you give me enough computers, I can probably do that. And you know, the training at Berkeley allows me to do that. So they start doing this. Um, all right, now the problem gets, the job description gets harder. Um, so the boss says, it should work reasonably well for anyone and everyone. I can tolerate a few errors, but not too many dumb ones that will embarrass us. Okay, so this is very different than the, thing, the, the kind of uh, loss functions we're used to thinking about in, in, in statistics. We used to think about the L1 or L2 losses where you tolerate some kind of fraction of errors. Uh, you could try to derive the fraction pretty small, but um, here it's really the L infinity error. You want to make sure that everybody's really being served well, or almost everybody, because the few people that aren't, the 5% of people who aren't getting served well are the ones who are going to complain in the newspapers and your business is going to look really bad and you're just not going to make it, okay? So it's just a different world to be in, to be, have these stringent error criteria. OK, so those are sort of statistics and kind of model building issues. But now the computer science comes in, um, the real computer science, the hard part. The new service should run just as fast as our classic service. OK, so now that's not an academic's pers perspective. That's the real world. All right, so you have been offering Google search for you know, a couple of decades, and people are used to this tens of milliseconds response time. Suddenly you're a lot of new services, which is personalized, it's better and all, but it's slower. Well, you don't have to be a CEO to realize that's not going to work, that you can't do that. Okay, so now you have to control the L infinity error on huge collections of models and have a runtime budget. All right, so I'd argue we just don't have that kind of thing in our field. Okay, we, we don't have that. We, we can pretend we have it. We can build systems and hope they run at a certain time. If they don't, we build them somehow bigger system, but we're hoping. We're, we're, not, we're not being engineers at this point. We don't have a real uh, discipline that allows us to do things like that. Right now, the problem even gets harder. Um, you know, my student is now walking out of the room thinking I should start to you know, be in another field. Um, but the real problem is even harder. And this, I think, is really where it gets really interesting. Uh, the boss says it should only improve as we collect more data. In particular, it should never slow down. So th you know, to th this year, I have terabytes of data. I'll have petabytes in 10 years. Uh, during that whole time, the service should never slow down, right? That, you know, the analysts on Wall Street won't allow that. Um, and really, why should it ever slow down? Because you're giving me this resource, this data. I'm giving you lots of data, and you like data. You're making all these great inferences and predictions. Um, and I'm giving you more of your resource. Why should you do anything that's worse? Why should it ever get worse? 
Okay, so now we really have no principles to build such a system that will scale and maintain L infinity errors and maintain a runtime budget. And of course the problem only gets worse because in the real world there's all kinds of other externalities. Um, so, so the data have privacy controls on them and we have to take that into account in building the system. Okay, so I like to use the metaphor of building buildings or building bridges and civil engineering. So, you know, for thousands of years, humans, rivers, they built things across rivers called bridges. They built buildings. And humans learned how to do this, and they did them reasonably well. But there were lots of disasters, lots of situations where bridges fell down and buildings fell down because they were built badly because people really didn't know. There wasn't a, a science or an engineering. At some point, there emerged this field called civil engineering, which was able to sort of dial in specifications. Well, that amount of wind, that amount of terrain, um, uh, you know, here's this principles that you build that particular bridge. And I'd say we just don't have anything like that in our field. We don't have an engineering of big data or of data science or of machine learning. Okay? We have some proto principles, but we just don't have anything like this. I think this would be decades long effort. Uh, you know, all the hype about machine learning, I think we're just far away from that. So people are building tons of systems and they're being deployed out there. Mostly they're for non critical things like search or commerce. You know, you get the wrong recommendations, it's not critical, you're not going to die. But it's going to soon be rolled out. It's already been rolled for the transportation systems, uh, for personalized medicine. And there are life and death decisions being made already to this day where people are dying based on false, false positives and false negatives. Okay, so as young people in the room, you know, take this seriously. This is really, you know, lots of bad things are going to happen. They will happen, I can assure you. Though. The false positives are real and they're going to hurt lots of people. And we have to kind of work towards principles. We just can't claim we can do it because we've got these algorithms and we've got these machines and we can do parallelization and so on and so forth. That's just... That's just not, that's not real good, that's not good engineering. Okay, so I think the way to proceed is to recognize that we really do have this thing called data science, which is a new challenge. It's bringing together principles out of computational sciences and the inferential sciences. Those are separate. It's not that computer science covers everything automatically just because it's algorithms. And, and it's not statistics covers everything because we have, you know, risk functions. They really are different traditions. So computational thinking, you know, it's got a lot of beautiful ideas, abstraction, modularity, scalability, particularly, and so on, and, and ideas to build systems that do those sort of things. Um, but inferential thinking is a really different style of thinking. It, it's not just about taking the data per se. It's about going behind the data and thinking how things were sampled and thinking about the predictions you want to make in data that you never saw before. And there's a 200-year tradition on doing that. So uh, bringing them together is actually quite non-trivial. If you just simply compute statistics or run machine learning arguments on data, you're not doing inferential thinking typically. In particular, you rarely have error bars. You can't make real decisions where you talk about the risk of your decision unless you have some notion of confidence and uncertainty. Okay, we don't have that typically in machine learning. Um, so just to say this one more time, uh, if you look at core theories that try to give you principles that you could build a field that puts the two together, I just don't think we have, the core theories don't to talk to each other. So core statistical theory is statistical decision theory. Um, it has losses and risks, but you'll never see the word runtime in statistical decision theory or in analysis of statistics papers. Okay? You'll see surrogates for runtime, like the amount of data, but that's not the same in is not the same as runtime, which is you know, in log in or in cubed or something like that. The whole field of computer science takes in and turns it into something like you know, in log in. Um, but similarly, on the computational uh, science side, you, know, you have a variety of forms of complexity theory, uh, communication complexity, Turing complexity, and so on. Um, they don't have the word risk in them, okay? You, you will occasionally see it here and there, but you don't really see it fully integrated in, in particular the lower bounds of computational theory that give you real principles and real guide just don't have risk. It's just, it's just not doable, okay? So people are groping around now at this point to try to bring these theories together, and that's a decades-long effort as well. Okay, so let me say a few words about uh, what we're going to do in the talk to try to indicate, the, I think of these as thought experiments really kind of principles, ways to bring together computation and, and statistics to indeed start to build, you know, this, start off on this decades-long hunt for principles that, for building systems uh, that work. Uh, so I'll say a, a little bit about privacy, a little bit about communication, really just because they can be done in 45 minutes uh, and give a hint of, or just at least a, a thought experiment, uh, example of the kind of thing I have in mind. And I'll turn to the last part a little bit on a variational perspective on runtime. Uh, so first part is a little bit of uh, uh, work on privacy and inference with John Ducci and Martin Wainwright up at Berkeley. Um, so I think many of you have seen talks on privacy. Um, it's, it's a success story. Uh, there's a notion of differential privacy, which is um, a uh, kind of a restriction on channels or on, on likelihood ratios. Uh, and what you want in life is to do data analysis under privacy constraints. So um, each of you in this room, might, I might ask you, can you give me some of your private personal data? Say, uh, I want your genome. 
And you'll say, whoa, my genome. Um, what do you want to use my genome for is the first question you'll ask. Okay? That means you want to know about my loss function as a statistician. So we're going to have a little dialogue here. You've got to ask about my loss function. I'll tell you what is. Well, I'm studying a disease that runs in your family. You'll say, oh, okay, then I'll give you my genome, you know, fine, just have it. Uh, or if I say, no, I'm trying to set insurance rates, uh, you might say, well, um, fuzz up my data a little bit, and then you're going to have it, okay? Because uh, I want, you know, to set intelligent rates intelligently for society, but, you know, I want a little privacy c constraint here, too. Or you say, well, I'm just, I want to use it so I can sell you some ads or sell you some product. And I say, well, no, uh, you know, fuzz up my data entirely. So I want a knob, and then everybody in the room has their own knob. So as a collector of your data, I'm going to get the data with all these knobs being turned, you know, being, I'm going to make guarantees to you that I'm going to fuzz up the data in the way you're asking me to. So we'll know that. We'll have had this dialogue, and then I'll collect the data, and now I'll do inferences on the data. Of course, the inference will be worse because of the fuzzing up, but that's okay. That's life. I got to fuzz it up, uh, and I want to know how much worse the inferences will be. If they'll be really, really worse, I'll have to get more data. I need to know all those kind of things before I start collecting the data or during the collection of the data to be able to make guarantees of the kind I'm, I'm alluding to. So we want to bring privacy together with inference. So let me make a cartoon picture of this. Now I'm going to be a database person. Database person, there's a database. Um, so imagine it's the usual kind of story. There's a bunch of bank data. I've got uh, names and addresses and ages of people, and I have how much they have in the bank. Okay, so I want to run queries on that, maybe the maximum amount or the median amount or something like that, and then get an answer. Let's call that theta with a twiddle over it in some unusual Greek notation. All right, now the theory of differential privacy and other such theories will make some, some guarantees about uh, privacy in this setting. They'll say, well, I can take the original database, I can put it through a channel, which is a typically a randomized channel, and I'll get what's called a privatized database where I can make some guarantees that I can't test whether you're in the data or not. Okay? So, um, and I can give the same query to the privatized database, and I can give it an answer, and the theory will prove that theta tip twiddle is close to theta hat, with high probability over the randomization of Q and over all queries and over all over databases. Things like that can be said, okay? So a successful example of uh, computational thinking, if you will. Okay, so I would say, so you know, you ask people in the field who work on this, is, are you also doing statistical inference here? And they say, sure, I, my query can be, you know, calculate the mean or the median. I'm doing statistics. Um, so I, I don't think that's the right way to think. I don't think this is inferential thinking yet. Now, to, to, to kind of go to the setting where this is inferential, Take a different example. Say, suppose the database is medical data. So I've collected a bunch of medical data where I've got age, height, weight, and, you know, and income or whatever. And then I have how much you lived, your know, lifespan, uh, if you got a drug or you didn't get a drug. Okay? So that's a typical medical database. Okay? So I collect that data. Now I'm going to um, try to protect the privacy of the people in that database, clearly. All right? But probably, I'm a doctor, I'm not going to be just interested in the people in the database. In fact, imagine the people in the database are dead and gone. Okay, so they're not going to be coming to my office tomorrow and I'm deciding whether to treat them or not. Some new person will come in. I want to make a statement about the new people while protecting the privacy of the people in the original database. Okay, so the picture is that I put a query into a database and out comes an answer. But what I'm really interested in is the population which was sampled by an operator S that led to the database and I want to make a query of the population. All right, what that really means is that I'm trying to ask about a person who wasn't in the data but could have been. Okay? And I've got to think about that sampling pattern S. It's not going to necessarily be IID. It might be stratified in some way. And so I've got to take that into account when I try to understand whether the querying will give me the right answer and how to do that. Okay, so this is what the field of statistics does. It, it does that. All right? And so you can, in statistics, make guarantees that theta is close to theta twiddle with high probability um, under, the all, under the sampling pattern S and under all P and under all queries. Okay, so I hope you can see where I'm going with this. To me, the real problem is to blend the two, to bring them together. Um, which is to say that I want to make a query of someone in a population who maybe not, was not in my data while protecting the privacy of the people who, for whom I did collect the data. And I want to guarantee that theta is close to theta hat. I don't care about theta twiddle at all, in fact. It appear, I don't need it to appear in my theory. But theta is close to theta hat with high probability over all S and Q, or from the probability generated by S and Q over all P and over all queries. Okay, so that's the kind of statements that we need to be able to make. Okay, so um, let me just briefly say, give you an example of doing this, uh, th this work that I've done with John and Martin. Um, so we need to quantify all the quantity, you know, what, uh, be theoretical about everything we've said so far. Uh, so we need to quantify what it means to talk about the, um, 
the, the, the loss and the risk. So, you know, sort of let's go back to statistical decision theory. Um, we have a loss function which uh, uh, measures how unhappy you are if the um, thing you're trying to infer uh, is theta of p. So if p is the unknown generator of the data. Theta is some descriptor of that, maybe a quantile. And theta hat is your estimator of that. And the loss quantifies how unhappy you are to give out the answer theta when the truth is theta p. Um, and Wald proposed to take a expectation now over that loss and call that a risk. Okay, so the risk is a function of p. Um, it's, uh, there's an, uh, uh, p is unknown, but it's the same p in the expectation and in the theta of p. All right, that's really interesting and critical. So computational complexity theory never, does just, for first order, doesn't have expectations. It has maximums everywhere. It takes worst case. Statistics, in the very core of it, has an expectation. And it doesn't have to, you know, the average case complexity issue, you know, that kind of uh, sink you in complexity theory are being skirted here because you do take an expectation. It's just with respect to the unknown generator of the data, which does exist, right? It's not just some average thing you, ma thing you made up. It does exist, okay? Uh, later, we're going to take Suprema, but right from the get-go, we're taking an expectation. So that's ma what makes it hard to actually put statistical ideas into complexity theory. Um, but we got to do it. We really want to do it. Uh, so now that object, that risk, is a function of p, which is unknown. And so I could have, you know, pay, think of p as a one-dimensional quantity. Um, so my risk can be some function of p. Your risk can be some other function of p. And if my curve always dominates yours for all p, then I just win. I'm, I have the better procedure. But typically, they cross. And so Wald recognized this and said, OK, let's look at the minimax problem. Let's, let's take the worst case risk. So now we'll be worst case. We'll take a supremum. But after we've taken the expectation. OK. So anyway, this is nothing new. This is back to the 30s. Um, but we now get an object, that thing at the bottom, which is just a number, okay, for the particular theta hat that you're using, just a number. Now, it's a number which is a function of all the statistical quantities that in the problem. The, the number of data points n typically goes as 1 over square root of n or 1 over n or, or something. The dimensionality of theta, you know, d, maybe goes d, d log d or something. But you know, 100 years of statistical theory for various problems studies that object there and writes down little equations of the form, you know, d log d over square root of n or whatever. Just like computer scientists write down things like, you know, d log n you know, for runtime. Okay, so uh, we've studied uh, 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 the local privacy paradigm in the particular paper I'm going to talk about here. We have private data x1 through xn. Um, it's going through a channel q outcome privatized data that you're willing to send to the central statistician at Google. Um, and so our estimator is based on z, but the, um, the data was generated from a distribution p. Um, uh, uh, in the form of xi through x1 uh, n. Okay, so differential privacy is a likelihood ratio based uh, concept that controls probabilities in the channel. It has nothing to do with p, it has nothing to do with the data generation process or the loss function. Uh, it's just something about the channel. So if I look at the output of the channel q uh, for a condition on x, the database x being the input, and compare that to the output of q where x prime was the input. So think of x as the database with me in it, x prime as the database with me not in it. And I look at the output of the channel for some adversarially chosen event s in the sigma algebra. Um, so I take a worst case supremum over s. Um, and I want that ratio to be small. Okay? So if that's small, then I can't detect whether x, the database was really x or whether it's x prime. I can't say whether I was in the database or not. Okay? Um, so it's kind of a tube around this. This is a likelihood ratio. So it's a tube around the likelihood ratio. And I've got a parameter alpha, which determines the width of the tube. Um, you know, so if I set alpha equal to 0, then I get a 1 on the right-hand side, and I want the likelihood ratios to be identical. I really can't detect anything. But if I start to turn alpha up, then I allow a little bit more discriminability, and I can start to detect whether people are in or not. But I now get different answers for different databases as, as I need. OK, so that theory exists. And there's, you know, we, uh, we chose to work with this for various reasons. It's powerful under, for example, taking two data sets and glomming them together. Um, and there are various good reasons to be using this particular formulation. Okay, so uh, now we want to put that together with Wald. We want to put that together with statistical decision theory. Okay, so our proposal is pretty simple. It's just to take a, make a constrained optimization problem out of this. Okay, so uh, the right-hand side, there's a lot of colors there, but it's the same stuff we already talked about. There's an expectation of the loss function. That's just the Wald's risk. There's a supremum, again, that's just Wald. And then the blue and femum, is the minimax. You're taking the minimum over the procedures to find of the maximal risk. Okay, so from the blue on, it's completely classical. And all we've done is add the green bit, which says now take the best um, channel in the class of channels which protect privacy to level alpha. 
Okay, so I'm going to guarantee you that I'm going to use a channel that protects your privacy to your desired alpha, and I'll then get to find the best channel in that family to get the minimal risk. Okay? So there's now a math problem, and you can, that whole thing on the right-hand side is just a number, and I can study that as a function of n and d and all the statistical constants as before, but also alpha should surely appear in those equations now. I should get some trade-off between n and alpha. All right? So we've studied this uh, in, for a variety of problems. Um, M estimation, uh, convex optimization, um, uh, regressions, and, and uh, you know, density estimation problems, and so on and so forth. So let me give you one example, kind of quickly. Um, so suppose people are coming into hospitals, and this particular person uh, you know, abused, uh, they abused various substances. This per person abused alcohol and cocaine and nothing else. And um, the underlying proportions in some city uh, suppose that they're pretty high, I guess. 45% of people abusing alcohol, 32 cocaine, and so on. Um, and I would like to infer the data on the, uh, the, uh, the, not the data, the parameter on the right. If I'm going to do public policy, I've got to know how many hospitals to build and how many doctors to put in each hospital. I need those numbers on the right. And classically, I just gather data on, like on the left and then take sample proportions. That's the maximum likelihood estimate, and it's a uniformly good estimate of the thing on the right. You know, no problem. But no one wants to reveal data like that data on the left. Okay, so what do I do? Um, well, I've got to fuzz it up in some way. So what's the risk that we should hope to get? Well, the classical minimax risk here is just, this is a first-year grad student exercise, is just one over the square root of the amount of data um, um, with appropriate dependence on, on D. Okay, so, uh, you know, I've set it up with an L infinity loss here because we're being this, you know, throughout this talk, we're being stringent about our loss function. It's also non-parametric, uh, all possible distributions on some compact set. Um, and in that set, you get this non-parametric rate, which is one over the square root of N. What happens, and that's gotten just by solving that minimax problem, okay? That's all you do. Write it down and solve it. Do some uh, expansions. Uh, so what happens if we now do the extra infimum over the uh, differentially privacy preserving channels? You get this answer. And all, what's changed is that from n, you go to n alpha squared downstairs. So alpha does appear in the equation, and it appears in a very simple way. It just multiplies the amount of data. Um, so, if I go to Pork and I say, uh, what's your alpha for this problem? He'll say, well, what's your loss function? I'll tell him, and he'll say, well, okay, for that problem, I want my alpha to be one half. And all of us are going to learn in the future about what that means. They'll maybe not be alpha you, some other number, but it'll be like, you know, it'll be like money. It, it's something you're going to understand, you got, have a gut instinct for. So he'll say, well, for me, that's a half. I'll say, fine. Uh, so I take a half times a half, that's a quarter. I multiply n by a quarter. I get, uh, okay, all I got to do to achieve the same risk as before is get four times as much data if I'm gathering data from people like Pork. Okay? I'll know that before I collect the data. So I can now still collect my data, still preserve his privacy, and guarantee to my boss I'll get a certain risk. All right, that's the kind of thing we need to have. Okay. Now, uh, it turns out that that n multiplying alpha squared doesn't just happen in this problem. It occurs in a wide variety of problems, so broad that we think this is, is a law. This is a law of statistical private inference. Okay? It's going to happen, and it happens for generic reasons uh, involving information theory, which I could tell you about. Um, now, so that's a lower bound. Uh, throughout this talk, uh, the, the goal to do theory is always to try to understand the problem by getting a lower bound. What's the best you can possibly do? And then try to find procedures that meet the lower bound. So that was just a lower bound, because it's achievable. Um, well, so what are the ways that people do fuzz up data in practice? In, in the differential privacy literature, a typical mechanism is, is to add Laplace noise to all the components of your vector. So if I take one zero, one zero zero, I can add uh, component-wise Laplace noise, heavy tail noise, and prove that I will preserve privacy. Okay? If you add Gaussian noise, you can prove you won't. It's not heavy. You've got to have a heavy tail noise. So I add that, different, that uh, heavy tail noise and I preserve privacy. But do I still do good inference? Or did I mess up my data too much for the purposes of inference? And the answer is you messed up your data too much for the purposes of inference. Okay? So this is prov provably suboptimal, and in fact, it's quite badly suboptimal for this particular class of loss functions. Okay? So you needed to do the statistics here to, to realize that. Is there a better mechanism? In fact, is there an optimal mechanism? Yeah, there is. So here it is, and it's going to seem like it's going to be a weak, a weak mechanism, but it turns, the theory tells you it's optimal, and you try and practice it, it turns out to be so. So here it is. Um, X uh, was just 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. All I'm going to do is take a random bit vector V, just randomly toss Bernoulli coin, and then look at its complement, 1 minus V. And then I'm going to transmit to the statistician the closer of V and 1 minus V to X. With probability, it depends on alpha. So with probability, it's proportional e to the alpha. 
OK, so if uh, Porik had said his alpha equal to 0, then I take e to the 0, I get 1 over 1 plus uh, 1, I get 1 half. So I just transmit a random bit vector to the statistician. I'm definitely protecting his privacy. But if alpha starts to grow, then I will shade it towards the truth, the, the real x. OK, so this seems like a weak way to leak data towards the statistician. Um, but it turns out it's optimal. Okay? It actually meets the lower bound that we got in our risk bound. And here's doing this on real data to bring this home. Sample size is up to 60,000. This is data from the Drug Abuse Warning Network. This is in the L-infinity error. Um, the optimal mechanism that I just described is the blue curve, and it's, it's on the log scale of significantly better than the additive Laplace mechanism. OK, so I'm done with a little vignette on privacy. Uh, we have a long paper which studies this for a whole bunch of other kinds of problems. And the generic result is that n goes to n alpha squared over d. I didn't talk about dimensionality here, but I could talk about it if you're interested. Um, anyway, I propose that not as a we've solved the privacy and statistics problem, but as an example of the kind of way I would want to solve the problem. Maybe you don't want to use Minimax. Maybe you're a Bayesian, whatever, fine. But I want to get equations like this because a, a user of, the, of privacy meets statistics ideas can use that kind of equation to know how to design the experiment. OK, uh, very briefly, uh, we've done the same kind of thing for a bunch of other kind of externalities, not just privacy, but for others. And I'll just briefly show you a second example. Um, this is work on compression. You know, so did Sh you know, Shannon solve the compression problem, right? Uh, he, he told you about optimal coding and, uh, and so on. The answer, you know, sort of yes, uh, Shannon was great, brilliant, but uh, he didn't solve the, the problem that we're after here, which is I want to do compression for the purposes of statistical inference. Okay, Shannon told you how to compress to get the bit length small, fine, but what if I want to compress the data and still do statistical inference on the data? That's a different question. Okay, and there's better or worse ways to compress the data and still preserve the possibility of doing statistical inference for some loss function. Okay, so that's the problem we need to set up. And uh, you know, the picture looks very similar. I'm going to have data which is distributed at, on m different machines. Uh, I've got a bandwidth constraint now. Um, I can't send the data all to the central site. It's too big. You know, it's petabytes. So I have a bit rate constraint b. And so I need to compress under some protocol down to b bits, and then I can transmit the b bits. How do I do that without damaging the data for the purposes of inference is the question. Um, okay, so we set up the same kind of problem as before. We now have a risk, uh, you know, the exact, exact same equation before. I've now put in the L2 loss because that's more standard for compression, so L infinity. But it's the same problem, and the little green part now is to do the infimum over uh, all protocols which compress down to B bits. So we don't have the privacy constraint involving alpha anymore. We have a compression constraint involving B. Um, and so I'm going quickly here, but I just want to show you the answer. Let's do this in a particular example. Let's try to infer the mean of a huge distributed Gaussian. Um, theta is a d-dimensional vector. We're going to distribute this over m machines, and I'll have little n data points per machine. So the total amount of data is 1 over n times m. So the classical minimax rate in this story is indeed 1 over nm. It's the, you know, the parametric rate, because we're in a Gaussian family here. Um, all right, so that's the classical result. What happens if I introduce this new B? Does B appear in the equation when I do the infimum uh, over the problem including B? And it does. So the new rate is the old rate, 1 over nm, times this factor out front, d log m over B, the minimum of B and D. All right, so um, there's an answer. Again, you can use it as a formula to design a system. Uh, but you can also, it's got a lot of insight out of this formula. In particular, B appears right next to D. And these are very different quantities. B is the bit rate. It's a communications part of the problem. D is the dimension of the parameter vector. But they're being brought into close uh, contact here. Uh, in particular, I typically would know D before the, my boss gave me D. Here says, here's a parameter vector you need to estimate for me. And I'd say, well, OK, maybe let's, let's set B equal to D, um, i.e., you give me enough bandwidth that I can set it equal to the parameter dimension you're asking me to, 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 to estimate. And they say, OK, we'll, we'll, turn, we'll pay money and get that bandwidth to be that high. And so, and so in that case, B and D minimum will just be D, and it'll cancel above and below. And now I'll get an uh, a, uh, error rate, a minimax rate, which is independent of dimension. Okay? So that's really interesting. The, you know, this is a new result. Shannon, this doesn't come out of Shannon theory. It's a, it's a new result, it, which is, says that um, there's a strong linkage between communication complexity and um, dimension of the, statistical, uh, the complexity of the statistical problem. OK, so again, that's kind of a thought experiment, trying to show what happens when you put statistics together with some other externality, in this case, communication. OK, so last part of my talk. I'm doing OK still. Um, 
is the bigger problem, uh, the one that's unsolved, the one that's hard, uh, of how do you bring statistics together with computation? So runtime, the thing that I alluded to earlier. Um, and I'd sort of say that to first order that no one knows how to do this yet. So uh, many, many people um, throughout the world are trying uh, various ways to bring these things together and it's not, it's, it's open still. Um, so here's some things that I've done in my group over the last really decade at this point, uh, trying to work on this problem and all of them are, none of them are, you know, kind of full-fledged formulations. They're kind of little attempts. So the first one was with Venkat Chandrasekharan, who's in the area somewhere. Um, he's at Caltech. Uh, we uh, linked statistics to geometry because geometry links well to computation. There's a huge literature on relaxations of hard computational problems according to various geometries and then the rates you get in terms of runtime uh, according to the geometry. If I take a semi-definite program and uh, you know, go to a, you know, a, a sum of squares problem and then maybe to a linear program, I get increasingly better rates computationally, known results. Um, and then if I could now li link those geometries to statistical uh, risk, um, I can get, uh, so in particular, if I start to relax the problem, my ris risk has to increase. And if I can get the rate of increase, then computation goes down as statistics gets worse, I can get a trade-off. And so we did that uh, for a limited class of problems. And that's the, that's the kind of the Achilles heel of that particular approach, that you have to do a lot of math for limited kind of geometries. Uh, lots of symmetries are needed. And we did that for denoising problems. Um, we've also worked on bringing ideas from the database literature into contact with uh, statistics, uh, in particular optimistic currency control. We have some papers on doing that. Um, the part I think I will talk about, I finally decided last, late last night, was talking about a little about optimization oracles, kind of how do you get lower bounds um, uh, on, on runtime. And then there's a lot of work on subsampling. This is a couple of projects in my group on bag of little bootstraps and variational consensus MCMC uh, that, you know, take parallelism seriously as a computational resource. How can I get trade-offs involving parallelism that talk about my quality of inference? Um, okay, so. Uh, all right, so uh, this is brand new work. I, I talked about it uh, a couple of weeks ago at UCLA. That's probably this and, and one other time. And so I'm just starting to talk about this. This is work with Andre Wibisono and Asia Wilson at Berkeley. So kind of a two year long project, which has finally come to fruit. And it's, uh, we have a paper now in the archive about this. And so I'm just starting to talk about this. Um, so this is an attempt to understand what's the, you know, the lower bounds on runtime, you know, for the purposes of optimization, which is our main tool in, in statistical machine learning. Um, all right, so how many of you know about Nesterov acceleration? Yeah, small number of hands. Uh, it's one of the big ideas in the last, you know, 40 years in optimization. Everyone should know about it. So part of my goal here is to talking about it is to just, you know, make it more broadly understood what it is and then try to explain it. So it's been, it's a very important development that I think none of us really understand. If, you know, maybe Nesterov understands it, but um, even he, when he explains it, it kind of gets, it's sort of hard to understand. Um, so let's uh, talk about what it is and then uh, a way to understand it. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about just for this part, this 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 part of the talk, uh, constraint, uh, unconstrained convex optimization. Um, a lot of these ideas do apply to non-convex problems, but that's a whole topic of its own. So let's talk about convex here. Um, you all know what classical gradient descent is. It picks a steepest descent direction, and then we're going to allow an oracle to tell me the optimal amount to step along that direction. Um, Okay, so this algorithm seems pretty good. It's taking the best direction. It takes the best amount along that direction. Um, it, you know, is it the best you could possibly do? All right. Well, clearly, if I let you, you know, calculate second and third order properties of the surface, you know, Newton methods could be used and so on. You could do better. But what if I only allow you to look at gradients? Okay. All right. So let's uh, Oracle will give you a gradient wherever you want one at any given time, and you can use that gradient in all path gradients and see what's the best you can possibly do. All right, well, this has a rate of one over the number of times you've seen a gradient, one over K. All right, is that a lower, is there a lower bound? Is it one over K? All right, and this is a very important result in the Russian literature in the, in the 80s, uh, you know, told you that no, there's a better possible rate. One over K squared is the best you can possibly do. It's a lower bound now under a particular model of computation. It's not Turing's model. It's, you know, Nimirovsky and Newton's model. It's a different model. And it's one that's probably more important to us as machine learning people than Turing. Okay, I mean, that's certainly more important. Um, so they said they found out that there is an optimal rate, which is one over k squared. And then there became the problem of, well, is there an algorithm that will achieve that? And Nesterov discovered that algorithm. It's, there it is. I've written it up. It's called accelerated gradient. All right. And it's not just one equation. It's two equations. 
Um, it has a kind of a gradient-like step, but the, gradi the, the gradient-like step is evaluated at xk, and the update is to yk. Uh, and then there's kind of a heavy ball kind of momentum thing that links the x's at the, the previous two x's, or, or sorry, the previous two y's, uh, to get the new x. Um, all right, so you can sort of stare at that for a while. You can draw a little picture, and you can try to understand it. Um, and many people have, um, and it's hard to understand. Um, it looks like it's kind of trying to do something in second order, but why, why is it good? In fact, why is it optimal? Why is it better than gradient descent? And is there a principle here? And, it, and does the principle extend to other situations? Because in fact, there's been a huge number of accelerated methods developed. There's accelerated cubic regularized Newton's method. There's the FISTA method. There's a stochastic versions of these. These things are done uh, now for accelerated mirror descent and so on. And um, that understanding you get out of the geometry, the Euclidean geometry of gradient descent does not carry over to these other problems. Okay? And really what carries over is just some of the algebraic tricks that Nesterov used to do this. So it's kind of, we're in trick land here, and so there, it seems like there should be an underlying principle. Okay? Um, so there's kind of an intuition as a momentum methods, and kind of, you know, Nesterov describes this as modeling the surface. There's kind of a, a little bit of a... Uh, intuition there, and there's been, in, in look at the recent dates, there's a lot of literature trying to explain this phenomenon, um, and these are all b really pretty papers. I particularly like uh, the Bubeck et al. paper on geometric shrinking. Um, I like Moritz Hart's uh, Chebyshev polynomial thing, so connecting this idea to other things that already exist. Um, but all these are for either quadratic surfaces or for first-order methods. They uh, offer strongly convex functions. They're just not the general picture at this point. Okay, so is there an underlying mechanism that really does this and does it for harder methods? And the answer, I think, is now yes. I think we have a proposal, at least. Uh, and the answer is to go into continuous time. So for those of you in computer science that went into computer science because you want to get out, out of differential equation land, you know, um, you know sorry, <laughs> I think you have to go back there. All right, and the reason is because in continuous time, it's easy to accelerate. Okay, I can go along a curve at any rate I choose just by reparameterization. Okay, um, so getting a theory of acceleration continuous time is easy. And the whole problem is then we go from continuous time back to discrete time so I can actually put it on a computer. Okay, and I think what Nesterov did was actually to develop a discretization method for a certain class of differential equations. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to show here. Um, so first step is to remember that gradient descent is just discretization of a particular uh, differential equation uh, called gradient flow. So there's, there it is, gradient flow. Just go downhill the gradient. In continuous time, there's no step size. There's no free parameter. Just go downhill. Uh, mirror descent is just doing that with the dual version of the, you know, the natural gradient. Okay, so the, what got us going on this line of research was a paper by Sue Boyd and Candes where they uh, took the Nesterov acceleration, those, those pair of equations I showed you, took the step size to zero and derived a differential equation. And then they studied that differential equation and learned some facts about it. In particular, um, accelerated gradient oscillates, uh, whereas gradient descent does not. And they wanted to study those oscillations. Um, so there's the differential equation. It's second degree, so you, know, you expect some oscillations. It has a damping term that's non-homogeneous. Um, so you can solve it and try to understand something about it. Right now, whenever I see a differential equation, I did enough physics to always think, what's the variational principle underlying this? Is there a functional that you're integrating for which that is the optimal solution? That dip Newton's equations are differential equations. Lagrange um, told us how to write that as a variational problem where those, the solution of those differential equations are optimal paths under some kind of a, uh, a variational uh, calculus problem. Okay, so what we're going to give you, in fact, is a functional uh, we call it the Bregman-Lagrangian, which generates that differential equation and all of the other acceleration differential equations. Okay, and it's going to do it very naturally in continuous time, and the whole problem becomes that one of discretizing to get actual algorithms. Okay, so that's what we're going to provide here. Okay, so here it is. I'm just going to go ahead and write it up on, page, on the first page. Here's a continuous time object. Uh, we call it a Bregman-Lagrangian. It has a scaling term out front involving some arbitrary functions, gamma of an alpha. These are just scaling functions, give you different rates. Then there's the Bregman divergence, critically here. Um, you all know what the Bregman divergence is. Hopefully it measures distance using this kind of uh, surrogate function h. Um, and so there's a Bregman divergence between where you are x and then x plus a, uh, a um, velocity term. Um, all right, that's the Bregman divergence. And the second term then is just the function f itself, um, you know, the kind of the potential part. There's a kind of a kinetic energy, a potential energy, uh, multiplied again by a time scaling function. 
Okay, so that, I that object uh, is our proposal for the underlying principle behind Nesterov acceleration. Um, okay, so um, in the uh, Euclidean setting, where the, where the Bregman diversion just becomes Euclidean distance, this just uh, uh, simplifies to that term up there. It looks very much like a kinetic energy minus a potential energy. So that's why we call it a Lagrangian. Okay, now it turns out that these alphas and gammas and betas are constrained. If you want to achieve the optimal rates, um, they have to be set in a particular way. That alpha is the only degree of freedom, and beta and gamma have to be set in a, in a particular way. We call these the ideal scaling conditions. So it's really just the alpha is the, is the degree of freedom, and then, of course, h, and then the function f that you're trying to optimize. Okay, so just to remind you of calculus of variations, you take something like that L thing, you put it inside an integral, and then you find the optimal x, the optimal path, which minimizes that, uh, that so-called action, that integral of the Lagrangian. And uh, in classical calculus, you set all the partial derivatives equal to zero. In calculus variations, the, the, the same idea is just to solve what are called the euler lagrange equations. They're just the continuous time version of set all the partial derivatives equal to zero. So you write down those equations. It's just taking a bunch of derivatives of that Lagrangian. So it's easy to do, taking derivatives. And, you, and out pops a differential equation. Right, so there's our master differential equation. It has x double dot in it, has a non-homogeneous term, uh, and it has then a potential function kind of thing which involves the gradient. All right, so I only have one minute left, so I'm just gonna say that, um, first of all, you can prove rates from the, with this with a one-line proof. You write down a Lyapunov function and take its first derivative and set, make it sure it's negative and you get rates for this in complete generality without kind of pages of proof that you need in the discrete time case. Um, if you want to achieve polynomial rates, which are what you get 1 over k, 1 over k squared, and so on, all right, then you set alpha in a particular way, as a logarithm of t, uh, and then beta and gamma are determined, as I said, and out pops that difference equation when you plug in, and you see p plus 1 over t. If p is equal to 2, you get the three out of over t scaling that, that, boost, uh, that Sue, Boyd, and Candace got. But you get a whole family of other equations that have higher order pr uh, p. But you can get rates not like just one over k or one over k squared. You can get rates like one over k cubed, one over k to the fourth. And there's a whole suite. You can get any polynomial rate you want, actually, out of this formalism. Okay, so that's a, that's a discovery. Um, this recovers for p equals two, some of the, you know, the mirror descent results of Creechin et al. And, and then the ODE of Sue et al. All right, so um, in the last 30 seconds, the, the whole problem now becomes how do you discretize that thing and still preserve the rate you had in continuous time when you go into discrete time? All right. Well, how do you discretize uh, second order difference equations? You write them as a pair of, of difference, uh, of a pair of first order equations, and then you apply maybe um, you know, Euler discretization. You'll get out some equation, you'll put that on the computer, and it'll appear to converge, and it'll shoot off to infinity. All right, it's unstable. You try some other discretization like Runge-Kutta, it's also unstable. All right? And it turns out that the way to make this, to get a stable uh, um, uh, sequence that converges is actually to borrow the idea from Nesterov of introducing an additional variable, yk, that, that so satisfies a certain property. You put that into the discretization, you can discretize the differential equation, it's stable, and it still preserves the rate you had in continuous time. Okay, so I'm out of time now. Uh, I had a couple more slides that I'm just going to now skip over. Um, okay, this kind of recaps that there is a rescaled gradient flow. There's, there's higher order gradient methods. We have these now, these, these Euler Lagrange polynomial equations. And the rates are the main thing I wanted to show you that you can get 1 over t to the p minus 1 and 1 over k to the p minus 1 in, in discrete time. And in continuous time, you get this, the corresponding rates uh, for arbitrary p. Okay, so I'm going to skip over this and go to the summary. Um, all right, so we have a paper on this, if you're interested, uh, that writes this Lagrangian down, and then it studies Lagrangian as an object in and of itself. That's kind of one of the reasons for going to it. It has its own mathematical properties and kind of helps to explain why these accelerations are occurring and why they're optimal. So how, in what sense, last comment is, you know, we're talking about optimization algorithms that are optimal. All right, that's already an interesting concept. So you must have an optimality principle for these optimization algorithms, and that's what we found. Okay, so these are optimization algorithms that themselves respect a certain Lagrangian. You had to, I mean, it had to be an optimality principle to assert that they were optimal. And so that, that we went hunting for that, and that's what we seem to have found. So, um, so thanks, I'm done. Time for a few questions before the coffee break. You started with a second 
Sorry, you started with a second order differential equation, this whole Lagrangian formulation. That started the line of research. Yes. We ended up with another object, which was okay. a Bregman Lagrangian, which ne doesn't necessarily second order. Okay. So you are not limited. In, if you go back to, in the discrete case, to the Langevin equations, which structure do they have? Yeah, no, these are just, this prints, this look, uh, order of has nothing to do with second order. It's just a uh, uh, functional on paths, all right? And uh, the euler Lagrange equations will go from that to a particular uh, differential equation. But it, w what we've sort of discovered here, it's not the study of the differential equations, it's not the study of the difference equations, it's the study of the underlying Lagrangian, which is the one that gives you the insight into what acceleration means and why it's optimal. Yes, but you can always go back, right? And so... No, you can't always go, you can't go, uh, if you discretize the wrong way, you lose the yeah, convergence rate. Keeping on the continuous case. Yeah. Which no, there's a, yeah, the, on the continuous case, the difference, you can, if you love differential equations, yeah. you just study them. Yeah. Or if you love no, Lagrangian, there is a, you can go back and forth. I love differential equations, so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they're not homogeneous, <laughs> and they're second order, so it's, you, you know, there's a lot, you gotta well, they can be, <laughs> The question is, can they be higher than second order? They, they are to give optimal uh, convergence rates. Okay. okay. So in fact, if you had a, it, we get, we take that Euler Lagrange equations, it comes out to be second order. That was a, that's a, that's a fact, a theorem, and, and and the intuition is that you allow yourself. You're trying to go downhill as fast as possible. A little oscillation, but too much oscillation would slow you down. And so third or third degree could give you would slow you down. Okay. So uh, you know, so greedy to say is just first degree. It's sort of too you know uh, narrow-minded and greedy. A little bit of oscillation gets you there faster, but too much oscillation would slow you down. So that, that just a, that's a theorem. Other questions? Oh, it's Italian day. <laughs> <laughs> so you started off with a question of how to trade off quality of inference with uh, t computation time. Yeah. So I can see that you've sped things up. You have not showed experiments showing that in practice it makes a big difference, but I'm sure that you have. Well, that's a whole literature of itself. But the, okay. Right. Yeah. So the question is, let's go back to the original question, how do you, so you can always be faster, but how do you decide how to trade off the two and what are your ideas on how to start? Yeah, that? so thanks for asking, yeah, it's the hundred million dollar question, which, so we didn't solve that, right? So I set it up in the first part of the talk, which is that we want to have trade-offs involving statistics and all kinds of other things. And I mentioned some of the ones were a little easier, and I, and I argued halfway through that runtime is hard and we don't know how to do it. So I think that a lot of us still believe that the right way to go is to use optimization as an oracle for, for the, the notion of runtime should be, um, well, uh, I'm gonna let you see some part of a function, you know, a gradient or something else, a certain number of times. That's your computation model. It's not Turing complete, but it's, it, it's, a, it's a model. And now how, how can you, good can you do with that as your resource? And that's still open though, to solve what is the best you can possibly do, and then how does it trade off? So in the last part of the talk, in fact, I stopped far short of where we wanna go. Um, and so the right way to head more towards a statistical story now of well, I got optimal rates, optimal, what does it mean to have optimal runtime? We have now an idea what that means. That's, that's, that's interesting. But do the, how do those rates trade off with risk? We don't have. All right, but we can do stochastic uh, calculus here. We can do stochastic variational um, uh, methodology. We can talk about that principle being robust uh, in the face of statistical noise. And we can start to bring in uh, statistical quantities. All right, so that's our ongoing work right now. I hope to report on it in the near future. Um, but uh, yeah, I think of these as kind of, I like to talk about this with a young audience because just uh, if you think that it's all been done and all the outcomes exist and all the theorems are proved, it's so far from the truth. You know, everything that's interesting is yet to be proved. And so we're kind of waiting for the next, you know, Turing or Komogorov to come along and sort of crack some of these hard problems about these real trade-offs. We don't have them really at all. Time for one last quick question. So I'll, I'll throw out a question since we don't seem to have one from the audience. Uh, at the very beginning, you talked about data science and statistics and machine learning. Yeah. Uh, the last 20 years, thanks to you and other people, uh, statistics and machine learning have come a lot closer. It seems like there might be a danger now that statistics is going to wander off back to, you know, uh, away from machine learning. Machine learning will do its own thing. Comments on that or thoughts? No, I don't see that at all. I mean, I think the data science word is actually not an academic word. It's, it's about industry need that industry desperately needs people who come in and can work with large scale data that are non-stationary, that change in various ways, that are interesting data and do inferential things like an A-B test. You know, on day one, you have to do something like an inferential thing. Is this different from this? What's my, if I need to make a decision, what's my error bar? Do I need to have more data? Those kind of problems are daily, you know, grist working with real data sets. So, the, the, you know, there's a trillion dollar economy 
emerging based on this. If we as academics can't respond to that, you know, we're just, we're, we're, there's something wrong with us. Um, so, you know, we should be, we have to bring our strengths together. You know, so actually Berkeley, one thing I might allude to, we're doing a freshman course on data science, which actually just attempts to have statistical principles like permutation test, A-B test, uh, bootstrap error bars, done with computation on Python, where students learn to program in Python with that as the goal, not to talk about, you know, Fibonacci series or something, but to talk about statistical inference problems. And, and I think then students love it and it feels like an integrated curriculum. It, it doesn't feel like go learn Python and then go learn how to do t-tests. It, it really feels totally integrated. Do the computation of a permutation test, that's a computational thing, and do it for the purpose of getting a statistical error rate and do it with real data, you know. So I think that's where we're heading. I don't, I don't think they're, they're diverging at all. Great. All right, let's thank Mike again.